The 1986 Miami Dolphins season was characterized by wild swings of fortune. One moment, they were brilliant. Another, baffling. The team's schizophrenic personality was never more evident than in a week three encounter with the Jets. This was one of the year's greatest games. But it was a gut-wrenching contest for the Dolphins. Dan Marino played a magnificent game, throwing for almost 450 yards and six touchdowns. From the New York 46, second down and eight. Somebody jumps, Klecko, flags are down, deep pattern, Duper down there, he's got it for a touchdown. And I'll tell you, this is, uh, this is the wild one. It's a track meet. 31 to 27 now. The teams paced each other down the stretch as the game seesawed back and forth between two combatants determined not to let victory slip away. With less than three minutes remaining in regulation, Mark Clayton put Miami ahead, but in this game, no lead was secure. With no time on the clock, the Jets forced the game into overtime. Befitting this shootout, it followed that the offense which got the ball first would also get the victory. O'Brien will play fake it, back he goes to throw, he's going for all the marbles, man down there, after an agonizing conclusion to a valiant performance, the Dolphins didn't know where to point their fingers or hold their heads. This was a game which typified their 1986 season, a roller coaster ride all the way. The Dolphins emerged from the darkness of an opening day defeat to notch their first win of the season, a 30-10 home victory against the Colts. Assistant coaches Shula, Sandusky, Tassif, Phillips, Studley, Matheson, Sikanovich, Westhoff, and Wade developed a masterful game plan as Miami dominated Indianapolis in every phase of its attack. The balanced offense produced almost 400 total yards, while the defense recorded seven sacks, the highest total in five years. Spearheading the defense was John Offerdahl, number 56, who made his Orange Bowl debut a memorable one. The rookie linebacker proved to be a big man with an even bigger future, as he recorded seven tackles and produced two turnovers. Offerdahl's opportunism rubbed off on fellow rookie James Pruitt, number 82. Pruitt demonstrated he possesses what every punt return specialist needs, the soul of a daredevil and the vision of a wide-angle camera. Here's Stark's kick, wobbly punt, racing up as Pruitt grabs it, drops it, picks it up at the 31, and he's going to run to the near side, 35, 40, 45, 50, he's gone, forget it, 30, 25, 20. Pruitt's 71-yard touchdown was an auspicious start to a season in which he would score twice more as a backup wide receiver. This rookie with a bright future can learn much from veteran Nat Moore, the Dolphins' all-time leading receiver. Over his 13 seasons, Moore has logged more than four miles in receiving yardage. But in 1986, the Dolphins also got great mileage out of Bruce Hardy, who produced the best season ever by a Miami tight end. While Hardy had 54 receptions, running back Tony Nathan was right behind him with 48. Adding depth to the Dolphins' receiving core were Jim Jensen, number 11, and Dan Johnson, number 87. Dolphin receivers totaled over 4,800 yards, with half of that provided by the tandem that kept defenders spinning their wheels in frustration. A pair of Marx brothers, who amused crowds with their wizardry rather than their wit, Mark Duper and Mark Clayton. We have a 
very friendly, competitive relationship because I think we keep each other going. I look over there and see him catching the ball, and then the next time I hope that he looks over there and sees me catching the ball. But it's not competitiveness, whereas we get envious of one another because maybe one is catching more balls than the other. We just go out there and try to make each other better. Duper surpassed Clayton's standard for 100-yard receiving games in a season by hitting the century mark eight times. This season, Duper earned his third ticket to the Pro Bowl in four years. Ironically, when forced out with an injury, he was replaced by none other than Mark Clayton, a man with his own unique approach to the game. I just go out there and just play with reckless abandon and just try to come up with the ball and make make something happen. I just play dangerous football, I guess. When Clayton reaches the danger level, he clicks on his spin cycle and hangs defenders out to dry. Mark Clayton and Mark Duper mirror images of unmatched success. Such success is rooted in the trenches. Miami fielded the number one passing offense in football, and credit must be given to the men up front. Two-time Pro Bowl guard Roy Foster was flanked by Greg Cook, Ronnie Lee, Larry Lee, Jeff Dellenbach, and John Giesler. For the fifth straight year, Miami's line yielded the fewest sacks in the league, giving Dan Marino time to sit in the pocket and dissect defenses with painstaking efficiency. Yet there is one man who stands head and shoulders above his peers in the National Football League. A man who has established a standard by which all other offensive centers are now measured. Well, many years ago, before we uh, drafted uh, Dwight Stevenson, I talked to Paul Bear Bryant. And he told me that the best college center that he ever coached in his entire coaching career was Dwight Stevenson. And I didn't know at that time whether or not he was building up Dwight Stevenson so that we would take him in the draft. But I took him in a draft, and Paul Bear Bryant was telling the truth. Stevenson often runs a one-man escort service. And no one values such treatment more than Dan Marino. In my opinion, Dwight is probably the best offensive lineman center that ever played the game. I mean. What he does for our team and what he has done that I have seen and the way he works, his work habits and everything, I mean, uh, you have to, have to really appreciate that. Dwight does something that most centers can't do and Woods is just handling the nose guard by himself. And uh, not only block them, but then go downfield and block a linebacker too. And uh, he does it probably better than anybody else has ever done it. Stevenson doesn't just assault his opposition, he lays waste to it. With his ability to dominate his man and demolish defensive strategies, this four-time Pro Bowl selection is arguably the best of all time. Stevenson and Marino often combine to form the equivalent of a football atlas by hoisting this erratic team onto their broad shoulders and carrying them to victory. Unfortunately, as Marino goes, so go the Dolphins, and not even his heroics could thwart a three-game losing streak early in the season. In a year of ups and downs, this was rock bottom for Miami, culminating with the loss of its best defensive player, Hugh Green, in week three. Mark Brown capably filled in for the injured Green, and the Dolphins boldly called on their future to help bail out their present. Accepting the challenge were rookie defensive end T.J. Turner, defensive back Renee Thompson, number 24, and top draft pick John Offerdahl, number 56. His predecessors were men named Matheson, 
Bonaconti, and Dewey, but only one Miami linebacker has ever been named a starter in the Pro Bowl, John Offerdahl, the Defensive Rookie of the Year. In 1986, what Marino was to the offense, Offerdahl was to the defense. In the third week of the season, Offerdahl assumed the team lead in tackles and never relinquished it, finishing with 135, 50 more than his closest teammate. Offerdahl was everywhere, proving he could do everything, shutting down the pass one moment, stuffing the run the next. and he always made his mark on opponents a memorable one. John Offerdahl, the blood and guts of the Miami defense. He started the year as a rookie, he ended it as a hero. Reggie Roby will stand at the 10, and he's kicking against this 20-mile-an-hour wind, pouring in through the east end of the stadium. He fumbles the ball, picks it up, and he's going to run with it, and he uh, flips it out to Jensen. Even Miami's special teams experienced a roller coaster season. He throws wide open upfield as Kozlowski. Two flags, but there's going to be call back as Kaz gets down to the 35, 30, 25, 20. He flips the ball up, tipped into the end zone, fumbled. Atlanta recovers, but it's going to be called back. That will make NFL film. The follies. <laughs> By relying on his leg and not his arm, punter Reggie Roby finished first in the league in net average and twice recorded the longest punt of 1986, 73 yards. Despite experiencing a bit of a sophomore slump, kicker Fouad Reves hit a career-best 52-yard field goal against Buffalo. Another second-year player, running back Lorenzo Hampton, fulfilled the great expectations that were anticipated of him when he was the Dolphins' top draft pick in 1985. Hampton scored all nine of Miami's rushing touchdowns, often with the help of blockers Ron Davenport and Woody Bennett, number 34. Hampton also broke the Dolphins' hex of 41 games without a 100-yard rushing performance when he played the finest game of his career in a Week 12 showdown against the Jets. New York was the winningest team in pro football, boasting a 10-1 record. The Dolphins had other matters on their mind. Miami attacked the Jets with a vengeance, with Lorenzo Hampton leading the charge. Hampton scored three touchdowns en route to gaining 148 yards rushing, part of an offensive explosion which saw the Dolphins amass 514 total yards. And there was reason to cheer the play on both sides of the ball. The Dolphin defense devoured Ken O'Brien and satisfied their craving for sweet revenge. This time around, they limited the powerful Jet offense to three points, not 51. When Don Shula watched his team put 45 points on the board once again, he could rest assured there would be a clear margin of victory. The decisive win enabled Miami to exact revenge and establish records. Marino tossed four scoring passes and became the first NFL quarterback to throw 30 or more touchdowns in three different seasons. Nat Moore also reached a milestone as he caught the 500th pass of his illustrious career. When it comes to rewriting the record books, though, the NFL's best-selling author is Dan Marino. Marino led the league in completions, yards, and touchdowns for the third straight year. He also threw his 100th career touchdown in fewer games than any man in history. But those are only numbers. The fury with which he played the game made the difference, as pointed out by Will McDonough of CBS Sports. He is the best, foot, the best football player in the league right now, to my mind. He's the best quarterback in the league, and I think if he keeps on playing the way he has played, he will get down as the best quarterback ever to play the game. 
Such admiration is also shared by Chicago Bears defensive lineman Dan Hampton. Probably the best offensive weapon in the league. He can make 40 yards at the flick of a wrist. I've never played against Walter Payton, but I've played against O.J. Simpson and a bunch of great players, and I've never been more impressed about any one man than I was about Dan Marino. Marino has made an indelible impression on his peers as well as on opposing coaches, such as the Broncos' Dan Reeves. It makes it tough to, to try to stop a guy that does so many things so well. He handles the blitz, I think, better than any quarterback I've ever seen. But Dan can be backing up, pressure coming at him, and he can still get some zip on the ball and get it to a receiver downfield with all the people coming at him. And I think he really hurts that. Uh, teams that blitz him more than any other quarterback in football. Here's Marino, back to throw, quick across the middle, Moore's got it, 15, 10, 5, touchdown! And they call it the free safety blitzing, he came up the gap, but Marino with that quick release, got it to Moore, cut it Marino is an expert at reading defenses, particularly prior to the snap of the ball. Yet he is also proficient at not being read by defenders. Here, he looks off the weak safety, then comes back and completes the pass to the opposite side of the field. This quarterback is always willing to take a chance, alert to exploit the slightest misjudgment. Marino is an intense competitor, fueled by his emotions as much as his ability. And as fellow quarterback Don Strock knows, Marino remains a student of the game. The thing I really liked about him was that he asked questions from sun up till sundown, and he wanted to know everything was going on, and he still does. He's a very dear friend of mine, and, and uh, one thing that I told him was, I said, I said, try to learn something new every day. Not only about football, but about life itself. And uh, you can only improve as a person and a player. Indeed, Marino is human after all. And there's always room for improvement. But not much room. Dan Marino. I just think that uh, he enjoys the, the toughest competitions. He rises to the occasion. He does everything that you'd want your quarterback to do. Above all, Dan Marino points the Dolphins to victory as he demonstrated in a Week 15 matchup with the playoff-bound Rams. Lee Flicker coming up, man wide open, Marino, this is going to go for a touchdown to Mark Cooper. Off the flea flicker, 69 yards. Marino play fakes back to throw, he's looking deep up the near side, got a man down there, touchdown, Dolphins! Marino really airing it out against this. An eerie sense of deja vu haunted Miami as a seemingly secure lead dwindled to an overtime tie. You hold on to the football or try to, don't make mistakes here. There's Marino, wants to throw it, fires for the end zone, it is caught! For a touchdown by Mark Duper, and the Dolphins win the ball game, 37 to 31, and Duper is mobbed by his teammates. Marino throws his fifth touchdown pass of the game, one of the great games in Dolphin history. The final game of 1986. Miami's curtain call in the Orange Bowl. For over 20 years, the Dolphins blossomed and battled there to become pro football's winningest franchise since the 1970 league merger. Team owner Joe Robbie watched his team play gallantly down to the wire before succumbing to a difficult defeat. For Don Shula, the 1986 roller coaster season derailed for the final time. While the team's 8-8 eight eight mark may be one Shula and Robbie would like to forget, some of their greatest memories are of two former players en route to the Hall of Fame, Larry Zonka and Jim Langer. 
Langer, number 62, began the tradition of great Miami centers which continues to this day. This six-time pro bowler anchored one of the most dominant run-blocking lines of the 70s, blasting open holes for the man they call the Zonk. Number 39 was the epitome of a power fullback. He was four yards and a cloud of bodies, the leading rusher in team history. Neither man nor Mother Nature could prevent Zonka from leading Miami to two world championships and the only undefeated season in NFL history. It is ironic that two of the cornerstones of this proud franchise are entering the Hall of Fame as the team prepares to leave the site of their past glories. Yet it is not the end of an era, but rather the dawn of a new one. For Miami will launch the 1987 season in a new home. Dolphin Stadium, a dream come true for Joe Robbie. Once the finishing touches are completed on the 75,000-seat state-of-the-art facility, Don Shula will focus attention on rekindling the Dolphins' winning ways. The expected return of Hugh Green, number 55, will bolster the defense. And no team in the league boasts a more deadly quick-strike offense. And here's a give-off to Hampton. Got a hole, 50, he's gone! Touchdown, Miami! The longest run from scrimmage in the past several years, 54 yards for Lorenzo Hampton. Marino will throw it. It is caught. 25, 30, might go the distance. The Dolphins' future is bright, and the roller coaster they raced on this season is now on the ascent.